Today we're going to leave Bohr's model of the atom and take a look at what's called the quantum mechanical model of the atom. To look at this, I'm going to take it into two programs. So today we'll look at part one. First off, let's begin with some problems that uh, plague Bohr's model. First of all, Werner Heisenberg came up with what's called the uncertainty principle. The idea that the position and velocity of an electron cannot both be measured simultaneously. One either knows all about one and none of the other, or all of the other and none about the one. So in this particular case, either you knew everything about its velocity, in which case you didn't know where it was, or you knew exactly where it was, but you had no idea of its velocity and hence its energy. Another problem that plagued the model was the development of what was called wave-particle duality. Louis de Broglie led the charge on this. Electrons, protons, atoms, and molecules, indeed, in the realm of the very small, exhibited both wave and particle-like nature. This was similar to what, um, how light behaved. And finally, when one moved to larger atoms, the spectra became far more complex than that that could be explained by Niels Bohr's simple model. So the quantum mechanical models seek to address all of these concerns. First off, let's take a look at uh, the concept of, of probability and where the electron is located, as outlined by Heisenberg's problem. The idea of Bohr's orbit put the electron on a two-dimensional path, hence one knew exactly where it was on that particular path. If one incorporates the idea that you can't know both, then all that one can say is where you are likely to find an electron. So if we take a look at this set of axes and at the origin we put our nucleus, the new model of the atom would say the electron could exist here, or here, or here. And in fact, there's a whole realm of possibilities where it potentially could be. This generates what we call a probability wave where there's virtually no possibility of finding the electron at the nucleus, but as one moves out, there's a higher probability of locating an electron, and eventually that probability disappears and becomes low again. So as you move out from the nucleus, you get a region where you're likely to find the electron, and this is what we call an orbital. I'm representing it here by the spherical-shaped balloon or cloud. This is called the 1s orbital. At the first energy level, it, there's a 90% probability that you'll find the electron somewhere in that region. When you move to the second energy level, we have a larger spherical orbit where we're likely to find the electron. But in addition to that one, there are some other orbits that also exist, or orbitals that exist, at the second energy level. What's called the 2px orbital. It's a lobe of probability that exists to the left and to the right of the nucleus. In addition to the 2px orbital, you also have the 2py orbital, where the electron could exist either above or below the nucleus. And a third p orbital, the 2pz orbital, where the electron could either exist out of our page or into our page, in front or behind the nucleus. So at the second energy level, we have a total of four possible orbitals where our electron could reside. When you move to the third energy level, the numbers increase. You have a spherical orbital. You have three possible p orbitals and these what they call d or diffuse orbitals. Now you're not responsible for drawing the shapes of the d orbitals, but you should have some idea of how to draw the s and the p orbitals. The important thing to understand here, as one moves further out from the nucleus to higher and higher energy levels, the number of orbitals increases, and their shape and complexity also increases. Let's summarize this a little bit in a table. So at our first energy level, we have only the spherical shape, the 1s orbital. When you move to the second energy level, you have the 2s and the 2p orbitals. And remember that there are three types of p orbitals for a total of four orbital options at the second energy level. At the third energy level, you have the s, the p, and the d, a total of eight options. You'll notice that the d orbitals, that there's five possibilities. At the fourth energy level, we have our spherical S shapes, P for our perpendicular clouds, D for our diffuse shapes, and the F orbitals, standing for fundamental. And there are seven F orbitals. If you look in the third column, you can start to see a progression here in terms of the number of types there are of each orbital, the one, three, five, seven. 
suppose you went to the fifth orbital or the fifth energy level. You would have 5s, 5p, 5d, 5f, and 5, let's choose a letter, let's call it g. And how many possibilities would there be for it? If you're following the sequence, there would be nine. I'm going to return to this diagram over here on the right uh, a little bit later on. I want to introduce now the, the idea of what's called an energy level diagram. Again, in order to understand energy level diagrams, we have to take a look at the concept of the Pauli exclusion principle. An orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons, and those electrons must possess opposite spin. So at the first energy level, the 1s energy level, I'm going to represent that by this rectangle and call it the 1s orbital. The electron can possess spin. It can spin clockwise or counterclockwise. If you've taken some electromagnetism, you know that a negatively moving charge that's spinning in a clockwise direction can generate a magnetic field and behave like a small magnet with a north and a south pole. We represent that electron with an upward pointing arrow. If the electron is spinning in the counterclockwise direction, it also generates a small magnetic dipole, but the north is oriented towards the bottom, and I represent it by a downward pointing arrow. Pauli's exclusion principle states that the 1s orbital can hold at maximum two electrons, and if it holds two, they must possess opposite spin. So here I'm showing the 1s orbital with two electrons in it, each spinning in opposite directions. So I use the arrow to represent the electron. The Aufbau principle states that electrons must fill the lowest energy levels first. So the first place that electrons would occupy is the 1s orbital. And as we increase energy and move out from the nucleus, we would then go to the 2s orbital and the 2p orbitals. Now, the 2p orbitals have a slightly higher energy than the 2s. So I'm showing them here slightly elevated or slightly above the 2s orbitals. When you move to the third energy level, you have the 3s, the 3p, and the 3d. And again, the d orbitals would have slightly more energy than the p and the s. And similarly, just for the four orbitals, but I'm not going to go all the way to the 4d or 4f. I'll stop here at uh, 4p. So when I'm placing in my electrons, I begin at the lowest energy level and work my way up. So in the case of lithium with three electrons, I would place two in the 1s orbital, and then I would place one in the 2s orbital. And that would be the energy level diagram for lithium. I'm going to add a third rule called Hund's rule. One electron must be in each sublevel with parallel spin before doubling up. Let's look at what that means by taking a look at oxygen with eight electrons. So I have positioned here three of the electrons from lithium. I'm going to add the fourth electron, fifth, sixth, and seventh electron. There you can see Hund's rule at the 2p energy level. I have to put one electron in each of those orbits spinning in the same direction before I put in the eighth electron. And I'll put the eighth electron in that first p orbital. Now you could put it in any of the three because they're equivalent. But the idea is you have to put one in each orbital first. So this would be the energy level diagram for oxygen. Let's look at a few more of these electron energy diagrams and something called electron configurations. At first glance, when you look at the energy level diagram, it seems to follow a logical sequence, 1s, 2s followed by 2p, 3s followed by 3p. But now notice these orbitals I've highlighted in red. It turns out that from an energy point of view, the 4s orbital actually has slightly less energy than the 3d orbital. Now, this causes a little bit of confusion. And let's look at why it happens. At the first energy level, there is only the s orbital. And its average energy here I've represented by this dashed line. At the second energy level, having both s and p orbitals, the average energy lies somewhere in between the two. And likewise, when I move to the third energy level, the average energy of my electron lies somewhere between the 3s, the 3p, and the 3d. And likewise, when I move to the fourth energy level, the same issue occurs. What you'll notice, though, it is possible for the 4s orbital to have less energy than the 3d, because as we move to higher and higher energy levels, the energy levels tend to converge and get more and more crowded, and hence the sequence that they fill up becomes more and more disjointed. To remember how to fill the electrons up, we turn to what's called the orbital sequence diagram. 
and I mentioned this earlier. I'm going to return now to this diagram. This diagram can be used to help us organize how the electrons should fit in the energy level diagram. The first place I go is fill up the 1s, then the 2s, then the 2p, and then the 3s, then the 3p and the 4s, then the 3d, 4p, 5s. And you can see the sequence of stitching through this as we move further and further to higher energy levels. So if you remember this little diagram, it helps you remember the sequence that our electrons would move and fill up. If I was to predict the next sequence, you would fill the 4d, the 5p, and then the 6s. It's now time to introduce something called an electron configuration, which is really a shorthanded way of representing the information that's present in my, electron conf in my energy level diagram. Let's return to lithium with its three electrons. I place those three electrons in the orbits that I've shown here, and now I write that down as an electron configuration, a shorthanded way. 1s2, 2s1, where the superscripts represent the number of electrons that are in that particular orbit. Let's return to oxygen. And that was our energy level diagram for oxygen with its eight electrons. So I would write that 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Let's go to the element potassium with 19 electrons. And there we can see its energy level diagram. So I would write it down as follows, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. Let's return to a, an idea you might have had in grade 10 or earlier grades of science. You might recall that when one was asked for the Bohr-Rutherford diagram for potassium, we would often write down 2881. Now we can see where that comes from. At the first energy level, or n equals 1, there are two electrons. At n equals 2, the second energy level, there's the s and the p orbits, and together that constitutes eight electrons. At the third energy level, there's the 3s2, the 3p6, again, eight electrons. And at the fourth energy level, we have one electron, the 4s1. And that's where the 2881 originates from. In my last example, I want to show you how to come up with an electron configuration and sort of bypass having to do the energy level diagram. Let's go back to our orbital filling sequence and write the number of electrons that each of these orbits can hold. So at the s orbits, they can hold a maximum of two because there's only one s orbit. At the p orbitals, there's three of them, they can hold six electrons. d orbitals, there's five of them, they could hold 10. f, there's seven, potentially I could put 14 electrons in those. I'm gonna take a look at the element iron, which has 26 electrons. And now just using this orbital sequence diagram, I want to determine its configuration. So I begin at the 1s, and I'll put two electrons in there. Then I move to the 2s with two more. 2p can hold six, so I place 10 of my electrons so far. Then I move to the 3s, put two more there. 3p, six more there. And 4s, two more there. A quick tally indicates that I've placed at present 20 electrons. I have six to go. The next orbit I fill up according to the sequence is the 3d. The 3d can hold up to 10, so my remaining six electrons will go in there. And I've now arrived at the electron configuration for iron. One is often asked, um, how many of these configurations do you need to know? Well, you need to understand the pattern, but you should be able to do electron configurations up to the element krypton in the periodic table. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to post them.